What I'd like to do over the next 20 minutes or so is to give you a, a feel of how the field is moving forward as we uh, incorporate new science and new techniques to the treatment of pancreatic cancer. Um, I can do. This is just summarizes of uh, the, the advances we've done so far. It's mainly based on cytotoxic therapy, standard conventional cytotoxic therapy. You can see on the left side the median survival for metastatic disease. We have just made it for one year, and then we passed the one year with the POLA trial. But the POLA trial only represents 5 to 7 percent of the patients, and only patients, obviously, who had good response to platinum treatment. So we still have some way to go. A lot, in fact, we have a long way to go. On the right side, you see the trials we had in the adjuvant setting and against cytotoxic therapy. And in recent years, we have seen some prolongation of the survival, partly patient selection, but certainly using uh, more active treatments. And the interesting thing here is obviously having a single agent, S1, giving you such a nice result. So basically, we have been focusing on cytotoxic therapy, not because of any reason, uh, it's because of this slide. And this is just starting in December of 2015 when I started collecting information on, on clinical trials, and you can see here that all, all these trials are negative trials. You heard about ibrutinib at the bottom of the slide, but also two days ago we heard about napabucassin, which was the largest phase three trial failed. And if you look at the targets, they're all over the place. We're targeting right and left stem cells, you name it. But certainly, these things have not worked. What does that mean? Well, in my opinion, we have to really shift from targeting a single target, a molecule, or a pathway, and we have to think more of biology. How do we interrupt, interrupt the biology of the disease? Because at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is not hit a target, but rather try to change the biology of the, of the tumor. And unfortunately, as you know, we don't have druggable targets in this disease. Uh, we rarely have anything we can go after, maybe less than 5% of the time. The biology is complex, but most of the time we don't have a good uh, correlation between a target and, or a presumed target and the, and the biology. However, if we move to, move to interrupting biology, then we can really make a clinical outcome uh, change. But most importantly, we can start thinking of rational combination treatments and, and then move on to molecular class classifiers and moving right into the personalized medicine. When you look at the ge genomic mutations in this disease, the bulk are between KRAS, which is, by the way, an early mutation. Over 90% of the patients have it. And then you have tumor suppressor gene mutations, P53, SMAT4, and P16, also known as CDK and N2A. Now, the problem with the KRAS is like your golf ball. It has very shallow uh, dips into it. It's very difficult to put a drug which can occupy that protein. However, there's work being done now to try to see if one can go around that. One of the recent uh, interesting articles that appeared in the literature was, was to target the downstream signaling from KRAS and also try to inhibit uh, or block autophagy. And the reason is that if you downstream singling block like ERK, you're getting this other uh, cooperation with autophagy to overcome your blockage. And therefore, using an old drug, repurposed drug, which is Plaquenil or, the, or, or hydroxychloroquine, combining it with one of these the ERK or MEK inhibitors, there is some evidence that you may be able to really help those patients who have KRAS mutated tumors. Now, this is going into clinical trials. There are several of them which, have, which are planned or already are undergoing in the United States. So this would be one approach. You also heard about DNA repair. Based on the genomic studies and transcriptomics done a few years ago, it is, it is uh, estimated that approximately 10 to 15 percent of the patients will have some degree of DNA repair abnormality that can be exploited in the treatment. Now, remember, 10 to 15 percent is far beyond what you hear about uh, BRCA mutations, because BRCA mutations is not the only thing that really is involved in DNA repair. But at the same time, you have to be aware that on the right side of the slide, you can see that this is a very complex uh, process. It's a very complicated system because there's all redundancies. It's very important to have our DNA clean. And therefore, when we plan treatments, you will be really going deeper into finding out which is going to be the best way to approach this, how to select patients, how to get combinations in place, and this is going to be very exciting 
for the next few decades. So the Polar trial is an example for you how we moved into biology. BRCA wasn't targeted. BRCA was something in the part of the biology that we're working on. And um, there are some questions about the Polar trial that we have to figure out. These are opportunities for future research. One of them is that can we use somatic mutations of BRCA to really expect to get the same results? What about uh, using the Olaparib in this case after patients uh, who have responded well to gemsabine nap paclitaxel or any other combination used up front? And what about using uh, PARP inhibitors in patients who have resected disease? They get the six months of chemo and then you can put them on a PARP inhibitor for a year or two. That is a trial that is currently proposed in the United States. But one of the things which is really something which we have to also keep in mind is that the PARP, uh, the POLA trial, we need to get some more mature data because the lack of survival might also tell us something. Future research in the DNA repair will be to us to expand beyond the BRCA and also try to find out better ways we can identify the patients who have homologous repair deficiency. So again, beyond BRCA. And then think of combination treatments maybe, and also trying to add immunotherapy maybe to PARP inhibitors. Now, there is some work which is done preclinically showing that patients with BRCA mutations, especially if they give them PARP inhibitors, tumors can also overexpress PDL1. In the United States, we have a trial that is currently proposed to do a study combining PD1 inhibitor with PARP inhibition. Moving on to the microenvironment, which is a very, very unique in this disease, and again, you have a mixture of stroma, myeloid cells, immune cells, you name it, stellar cells, and how do we really approach that? We think that's very important. The microenvironment will be an important area of biology that we have to really deal with. It promotes the drug resistance, progression, and also it's very desmoplastic, so physically it may be interfering with delivery of drugs, and also it's an immune desert. There aren't that many T cells that are allowed in to the tumor itself. There are a number of approaches to attack the stroma. Uh, hedgehog, we heard about it before, it failed. Probably failed because we didn't know how to use the drug in the clinic properly. At this point in time, pegylated PEG PH20, I, I, I say a couple of things about it. CD40 agonists and a few others. The hyaluronan, which is the stromal a material that can block the access of the, of the cancer cells to the tumor, that, is, that can be digested and broken down by giving the enzyme, the hyaluronidase, which is pegylated, therefore you can give it IV. There is preclinical work on the left side of the slide, and in the middle you can see that you can select patients with immunohistochemistry for hyaluron overexpression, and, and then there is a study that was pilot trial showed that you can prolong the disease progression by giving combination of uh, the PEG page 20 plus gem 7 up back taxol, and that led to the right of the slide, uh, the uh, part of the picture, the, a, a randomized phase 3 trial that's completed in patients who are HA high, higher and high, which who, who represent probably around 30 to 40 percent of the patients. And this trial has to report sometime at the end of this year. However, we at the Southwest Oncology Group did a study where we combined for Fairnox with uh, PEC-PH20. And what we found was we got exactly the reverse, what we ex wanted to see. Patients on the control arm did better than patients who had the combination. And if you look at the bottom of the slide, the median number of cycles received by the combination with uh, PEC-PH20 was half of what patients received in the control arm. And that was because of, as you would expect, toxicity. So this raises an important point. When we do those clinical trials, especially in a disease like pancreatic cancer where patients have sometimes borderline performance status, how much can we expect to just add a drug to combination chemotherapy? And Dr. Tampere showed you the, the, the study uh, of ibrutinib where patients with control, on the control arm were taking more of the active agents, gemsabinab, paclitaxel, because of toxicity issues. So that's something that one has to keep in mind. We, we're not saying that PEC-PH20 is not working based on this trial because we're concerned about the fact that we didn't give enough treatment for the patients. Moving on with uh, another aspect of biology is tumor metabolism, the Warburg effect, which you've known about for a long time, 
and it's a different, it's, a, it's the utilization of, of uh, energy and production of energy in the tumor cells. And that's something which can be also nowadays thought about as a target for, for treatment. And, um, and there is an agent which is called CPI613, and this drug targets two enzymes in the Krebs cycle, and it's going to be a differential effect in the tumor cells. And there is preliminary data based on a pilot trial published in the Lancet Oncology a few years ago showing that the combination has uh, some degree of activity which was worthwhile to consider a randomized phase three trial. Now, one thing which I want to really take, uh, take, uh, sh uh, draw attention to is that in this trial, they used a lower dose of fulfenox, and that was possible to, to combine the two and avoid excessive toxicities. And this trial went, went to the FDA for the phase three trial. The FDA approved the lower dose of fulfenox versus a standard dose of fulfenox. Uh, Dr. Van Kassam and I are also involved with this trial, and I had the pleasure of working with him on it. Moving on to another aspect of uh, uh, metabolism is the L using L-asparaginase. Uh, this is a drug which is, uh, which is now being developed in the, in the treatment of uh, pancreatic cancer based on data which was initially presented by Dr. Hamel two years ago, showing that combining this drug with Folfox in the second line setting showed some survival benefit. And the combination was relatively well tolerated, and that led to moving the combination to a phase three trial, which is called the Tybeca, which is currently enrolling. And this will be in the second line in patients who fail frontline treatment, and they can get any type of chemo, any, two types of chemo, depending on what they received in the frontline treatment. This will be a good sized trial of 500 patients. So we're hoping that this trial goes well and we get some positive results. Now, there is no talk which is complete without saying something about immunotherapy. Unfortunately, I don't have to tell you much about immunotherapy here. You know that this disease is relatively immunosuppressed. There are a few T cells that are getting into the tumor, and those T cells that are getting into the tumor are so afraid they're not doing anything. But also, that's because there are other bad cells there. These are like, for example, myeloid cells, macrophages that also affect the ability to mount an immune response. And so far, the trials that involve immunotherapy haven't really done well in this disease. This is a trial that uh, Dr. O'Reilly and I were involved with, and in this trial, using the uh, Durvalumab plus minus ctl 4 inhibitor, uh, I always find it difficult to, to pronounce it, Tramelinumab, in this trial, unfortunately, the, the results were very negative to the point that further development was not possible. And in fact, in this trial, there was one patient who did extremely well, but then you go back and look at the patient, PDL1 negative, MSI stable, and you don't know why one patient has done very well. So what we're trying to say is that maybe we have to move into combinations in the immunotherapy. And at this time, there are several possibilities that are being tested, uh, CD40 agonist, anti-CXCR4 uh, agonist, and then you have the chemotherapy combinations, which I don't think they're going to go anywhere, and then you have some other combinations. Now, there's another drug which is currently uh, being tested. It's a pegylated IL-10, and this, this was presented here on this podium, um, uh, I think, several, a couple of years ago. It's a drug which enhances the CD8 cytotoxic cells, and at the same time, it has the good effect in, in, in cutting down on the inflammatory cytokines. Always something you get a bit worried about because these cytokines may have different roles, positive and negative. And this study is currently, uh, this drug is currently in a phase three trial uh, using a combination of Folfox in patients who have failed prior gemcitabine based treatment. CD40 agonist is of interest, and it's of various, varying interest. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes comes down. And the CD40 agonist indu induces uh, the activity of, the C uh, of as you know, um, the, CD is, uh, the T lymphocytes, uh, the killing T lymphocytes, and, 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 it, uh, and it's considered to be a way of trying to activate the immune system. And, um, and if you look at the bottom of the slide on the, on the left side, you can see that in this particular study that I'm going to talk about, they really documented to you how the macrophages in the tumor were really abundant, whereas the CD8 cells were really 
deficient. So this is just a proof that you're trying to really activate the CD8 cells and keeping in mind the macrophages have negative effect. In this trial, that was a combination with gemcibinab, paclitaxel, but also some patients received nivolumab. There was some degree of activity that was interesting. The study is currently ongoing. The numbers are not that many, so I can't give you anything more, probably something you hear about next year or year after. But again, just to give you an idea of one other way of trying to improve the immune system. But the macrophages are a real problem in this disease and other diseases where immunity needs to be enhanced and also the biology changed. And these myeloid derived uh, suppressor cells are traveling from the bone marrow, go to the tumor area. I don't know why they want to do that, but certainly when they're there, it's a problem. There's a drug which is uh, anti-CSF1R, and it's not the only drug available. I'm just giving an example of a clinical trial. And this, this drug is currently in, um, in, clin in, a, in, a, in a randomized phase two trial, but there was some initial interesting results seen with the, with the smaller study that was done as a pilot, and that's in the bottom of, uh, of the slide on the left side. So this is another way trying to move forward in terms of trying to modulate immunity. And there's also evidence that if you combine the two CD40 and anti-CSF1R, you may be able to re-educate and retrain the macrophages. Again, a combination of the two drugs is a, is a way possibly to go forward, although I have heard some skepticism of whether we should really take that route. But certainly it's something which is worth testing in humans. Just trying to finish off, close to finishing off, Systemic treatment landscape at this time is a bit different than it was two, year, two or three years ago. We have now more ways of thinking of how to really treat the patients. It depends on patients who get uh, adjuvant treatment, whether they get a gemcitabine based or for Fernox, and there's a pathway beneath that. And, in, and also in metastatic disease, we have to use the personalization based on performance status, organ function, patient preference, and we have a way of going down. The, the second line treatments that we can offer that I didn't touch on. And then in, in a small percentage of patients, we may look into the BRCA, and that has a different pathway now. So the hope is that this slide gets bigger and bigger, more crowded as we go in the next year or, or two. There was some discussion about radiation treatment. Well, we're discussing radiation treatment. It's a dynamic discussion for two reasons. One is at the top of the slide, you see that we are improving systemic disease control. And at the bottom of the slide, you see that the mechanism or, or the modalities of, re, of local t treatment are also improving. So I think at, this, at one point, we have to recognize the fact that local, local regional treatment will help some patients. There was a question about one-third of the patients dying with only local disease. And I think that's an area where we have to move more and more in trying to get better delivery and know how to and who to give the treatment uh, in this situation. We're also developing molecular classifiers to really understand the disease better and trying to get this whole story about biology and how do, how do we personalize treatment. And there are a number of classifications, but we still have to apply it to the patients. Finally, finally, supportive care, something we forget about, but it's a very important aspect of the treatment. In my practice, most of my stage four patients are referred to supportive care even when I start giving them chemotherapy because it's a way to improve quality of life, and also it's a way to try to get, deliver more treatment and better treatment and facilitate sequential treatment. Just to finish off, cytotoxic therapy is the mainstay of treatment, continues to be so. A single molecule, molecule hitting, I show you that slide, long list, is not working. And, and, our, and biology is the real thing we have to go after. DNA repair, we started off with, tumor metabolism, um, tumor microenvironment, that's a big area. And then combination therapy is really going to be the, the future. We're not going to really be able to hit one target and claim that we can do something, even if we're targeting the biology. And we need better classifiers. With that, I would like to thank you again for your attention and for invitation for me to come here.